This is Brian Schwartz from the University of California, San Francisco. I'm an infectious diseases doctor and excited to talk with you today about bacterial meningitis. We're going to be focusing now on diagnosis and common pathogens. Our specific learning objectives are for you to be able to interpret cerebral spinal fluid results from a lumbar puncture to differentiate cause of meningitis and know the common bacterial causes of meningitis by age group. So let's start off by talking about the lumbar puncture, which is one of the key tests used to make the diagnosis of meningitis. The lumbar puncture allows us to safely directly sample cerebral spinal fluid, which can show us evidence of infection and inflammation. How is this done? Uh, sampling is done by putting the patient in a, uh, a reclined position, although sometimes it's also done in the sitting position. And a hollow needle will be injected uh, into uh, the subarachnoid space uh, where cerebral spinal fluid would be aspirated. The cerebral spinal fluid is sent for cell count, uh, looking often for evidence of white blood cells, and the type of white blood cells may help differentiate bacterial versus viral infection. We will look for protein because when there is inflammation, usually they'll have elevated protein and the how elevated the protein in may help distinguish. Glucose also, because glucose uh, may be decreased in the setting of infection. And gram stain, um, obviously if you're able to identify bacteria on gram stain, it'll be helpful in making a diagnosis early. And ultimately, bacterial culture is sent because culture is much more sensitive than gram stain for making that type of diagnosis. So specifically, we use the CSF um, to interpret, and, and, and let's look at some different examples of cerebral spinal fluid findings and how it differentiate in different types of central nervous system infections. So for example, bacterial meningitis, our classic example, we'll use streptococcus pneumoniae. You would see very high white blood cells. And when you think about what type of white blood cell you'd see, it would be neutrophil predominant. And that's a very important distinguish to make because you can see below a lot of these are lymphocyte predominant. The glucose would be low, and the protein, um, the glucose would be low, um, because uh, through this process, uh, the glucose um, is transported out of the um, cerebral spinal fluid uh, in the setting of this type of inflammation. I think in days past, it was felt that it was due to consumption uh, by the bacterial organisms, um, but I think some evidence suggests otherwise. The protein is elevated in the setting of inflammation as well. Viral meningitis, you'll have elevated white blood cells, but here would be lymphocyte predominant. You'll have a normal glucose, and you'll have a pr elevated protein, but usually less so, less high than in bacterial. With chronic meningitis, which the classic example of chronic meningitis is with mycobacterium tuberculosis, or TB, you can have elevated white blood cell, again lymph predominant, very low glucose, and very high protein. And then in encephalitis, one of the classic examples being herpes virus, you may have actually no white blood cells at all in there because remember, this is inflammation of the brain and not necessarily meningeal inflammation. Um, when you do have white blood cells, usually they're lymphocytes, normal glucose, and you may have some elevation in protein. So thinking about the microbiology results you'd use, the gram stain allows you for early identification, but as I mentioned before, the sensitivity is low. Here is a gram stain of gram-positive diplococci. So what do you think this is? Streptococcus pneumoniae. And then the culture being the most sensitive, um, you can see here um, the uh, growth of bacteria on blood agar. So lumbar punctures, for the most part, are very safe, but in select patients, the lumbar puncture may not be safe. And the people that are at risk for those that have mass lesions and increased intracranial hemorrhage, because you could have herniation um, if you did a lumbar puncture and decrease pressure below um, this high pressure area uh, up high. So what you can do is get a CT scan to usually assess the safety of a lumbar puncture for looking for evidence of a mass lesion or increased intracranial pressure. Here you can see there's a large uh, mass lesion in the brain uh, on the CT scan of this patient. So who is it recommended to get a CT scan? Is it all patients who come in? It's actually not. It's specifically people with signs and symptoms suggested of increased intracranial pressure or mass lesions. And there's been studies to look at this. So if you have a patient who comes in with 
altered mental status, a focal neurological deficit, who's known to be immunocompromised, has papilledema, or came in with a seizure, it is recommended to get a CT scan before you perform a lumbar puncture. So when we think about pathogens causing meningitis, we tend to think about it in terms of age um, because this is one of those diseases where it often the, the species uh, that cause disease cluster by age. So neonates, um, and we'll talk a lot more about this, tends to be group B strep, E. coli, listeria. Younger children, it's strep pneumoniae, Neisseria meningitidis, and outside the U.S. and in the past in the U.S. was Haemophilus influenza type B. In young adults, Neisseria meningitidis and strep pneumo, and then adults, particularly over the age of 50, we think about streptococcus pneumoniae, Neisseria meningitidis, and Listeria monocytogenes. You can use this as a reference. We'll come back to this, and we'll talk about it in more detail. So now going back into more detail about neonatal meningitis, here the mechanism is really peripartum acquisition of bacteria via the mother, often through um, uh, the infant uh, exiting through the vaginal canal and acquiring bacteria. Risk factors are prolonged rupture of membranes. So if that amniotic fluid was infected, the child would. Common pathogens here, as I mentioned, are Streptococcus aegalactiae, also known as beta hemolytic group B strep. Here you can see these are gram positive cocci that often on gram stain will show in chains. E. coli, um, here E. coli you can see is a gram negative rod. And Listeria monocytogenes, which is a gram positive rod. Haemophilus influenza type B, which we said uh, used to be an important cause of disease in young children, is a gram negative rod. Um, it usually, um, its mechanism is it in uh, causes mucosal colonization and then invasion um, through the bloodstream would then go into the CSF. And it, it was the most common cause of pediatric meningitis. And you can see here this study looking in 1986, looking at meningitis in different age groups. There was, um, in those ages 1 to 23 months, there was a huge number of cases of bacterial meningitis in this age group. And between 1986 and 1995, there was a tremendous dropoff. What was that? That was the introduction of the Haemophilus and influenza type B vaccination. Extremely effective and really cut down on the amount of meningitis in that age group. So now, in we see this very uncommonly in the U.S., now let's talk about Streptococcus pneumoniae, which is one of the most common, and actually is the most common overall cause of meningitis. It causes mucosal colonization, which again gets into the bloodstream and gets its way to the cerebral spinal fluid. Risk factors are having no spleen um, and other immunodeficiencies. Um, as I said, it's the number one cause overall of bacterial meningitis and continues to have a very high mortality rate. Despite all the things we've learned, it's still, there's about a 20% mortality rate associated with this infection. Now, Neisseria meningitidis, and if, um, if you've seen some of the other um, lectures that we've done, we've talked about this in quite de detail. Um, it is a gram-negative diplococci, you can see here. Um, again, mucosal colonization, hemodogenous spread, and into the cerebral spinal fluid. Important risk factors are direct contact with an infected patient, complement deficiency, particularly defect in the terminal component of the complement pathway, C6 through C9, or travel to a high-risk area where there's epidemics. So there's actually this area in sub-Saharan Africa called the meningitis belt where there's very high um, rates um, relatively of Neisseria meningitidis. Age groups in the U.S. that are infected most are young adults, and there's been associations with outbreaks in both the college and military establishments. Besides causing meningitis, you want to think about the syndrome of meningococcemia. Meningococcemia is when there's disseminated infection, and um, there's a number of virulence factors that allow it to penetrate uh, into the bloodstream. But in terms of what causes such a robust immune response and a lot of the clinical manifestations, it's the presence of endotoxin or lipooligosaccharide um, that causes this inflammatory dysregulation that results in septic shock, disseminated intravascular coagulation. And you can see here, this is an infant with what we call purpura fulminans, these big purpuric lesions of necrosis uh, where there has been clotting off um, of blood vessels associated with this disseminated infection. Lastly, we're going to talk about Listeria monocytogenes, again, a gram-positive rod. Um, usually, this is neonatal acquisition from the mother. However, um, in 
um, adults, particularly immunocompromised patients, they may ingest this um, and then get infection as well. Risk factors are immunocompromised state, pregnancy, neonates and elderly, and being exposed to contaminated food in an outbreak. Um, classically, as you can see here in this picture, uh, deli foods um, are associated with this. But there also have been outbreaks recently with um, cantaloupe um, and lots of other produce. Um, clinical disease is meningitis, but it's important to recognize that it can also cause brain abscesses. So now we're going to come back to that chart and talk about a summary of pathogens by age. And I'll let you look over this on your own. I won't reread it at this time, but you can see this is a listing by age group of what are the most common pathogens.